a very good good afternoon to all of you i am shobha mishra ghosh assistant secretary general fiki and on behalf of federation of indian chambers of commerce and industry and elsevier i extend a very warm welcome to all the speakers and participants of this web session on anxiety management during epidemic against covid uh, warriors healthcare practitioners and nurses i am extremely pleased to introduce our esteemed panelist professor matthew verges professor of psychiatry nimhans mr gautam khanna co chair fiki health services committee and ceo a pd hinduja hospital and mrc dr atrey ganguly national professional officer mental health and substance abuse who india mr shankar call managing director elsevier india and dr ujwal rao senior clinical specialist elsevier india who will also moderate this session friends this is the second fiki elsevier webinar in context of covid the first one was held uh, on may 11th on adopting implementable strategies during lockdown as we all know healthcare workers across the continuum from practitioners doctors under training nurses to senior health experts as well as support and frontline staff have been exposed to this extraordinary situation owing to the covid-19 pandemic causing enormous psychosocial impact unheard of in the modern times although caring for one's mental health and managing anxiety has become an integral part of staying healthy and managing through this global crisis the well-being and emotional intelligence of healthcare workers are of utmost importance for maintaining essential healthcare services during this pandemic studies regarding the 2003 sars outbreak from canada taiwan and hong kong have showed how the battle against sars led to huge psychological morbidity amongst frontline healthcare providers a cross sectional study of almost 1257 healthcare workers treating covid-19 patients in 34 hospitals in china demonstrated that half of the respondents had at least mild depression and one third reported insomnia the situation in india might be worse unprepared health system shortage of workforce and supplies increased workload uncertainty of response and treatment physical strain of protective equipment stress of isolation there have been various stress factors leading to negative mental health outcome that can include anxiety depression and post traumatic stress disorder the government of india has been cognizant of this and has been working in association with department of psychiatry nimhans as well as the world health organization to provide the technical guidance on managing mental health and anxiety amongst our covid warrior and this was a topic that both fiki and elsevier feel extremely uh, you know concerned about and that's the reason why today this uh, webinar has been organized it is now more than ever that we all must come together and urgently invest in wellness culture and evidence based interventions to pro prevent a tsunami of stress and anxiety related problems especially in the frontline workers following this pandemic this makes it crucial that appropriate information remedy and solutions are shared widespread and health professionals are adequately trained to tackle the mental health challenge in this context fiki and elsevier have collaborated to organize a web session on the topic Uh, anxiety management during epidemic amongst covid warriors healthcare practitioners and nurses post this session we intend to follow up with a capacity building workshop and then collate actionable actionable recommendations that will be shared with the government as well as the industry at large our panelists who are leading subject matter experts will share their valuable experiences and insights on how to deal with anxiety management in the current scenario as i mentioned earlier dr ujwal rao uh, senior clinical expert a uh, specialist elsevier india is going to be moderating the session he is experienced emergency physician executive clinical informatics 
practices um pardon me and technology evangelist and has vast experience serving in trust and corporate hospitals in various roles ranging from clinical administration hospital operations to quality and accreditation dr rao is also an assessor on the panel of quality council of uh, india for nabh over to you dr rao thank you shobha good afternoon everyone and welcome to our webinar focused on mental health of our frontline health workers during the ongoing covid 19 pandemic uh this is a, a special uh, topic uh, you know in terms of the pertinence in our current times but also personally uh since i'm reminded of my emergency medicine days where i faced the brunt of burnout and also things like vicarious traumatization and uh, also led healthcare and mental health support structures during the h1n1 pandemic but covid 19 has has changed all definitions and preconceptions we've had about health and mental health and that's the reason why we thought it pertinent to invite a panel of experts from across the industry from from the science of psychiatry mental health from an international perspective and also from an industry leading expert from from the private sector uh, also advising the government of india and today uh, it is it is very pertinent to actually note that in the current times it's it's the sense is that it's okay not to be okay and we want you to have comfort in that feeling but at the same time walk away with certain takeaways on how to cope up with the stressors that that are that are existing today and also to come out stronger when we end up with uh, you know going the other side of this pandemic and i think the the amount of um, work that we would have done to actually come up with with a more stronger function of mental health is something that we intend to address today we will initially be taking key messages from our expert panelists and then we will get into a question and answer session and i was discussing with a panelist earlier last week on how important it is to address as many questions as we can and i'm sure you have plenty so there is a q and a tab at, at the bottom of your screen um mind you you are muted uh, during this uh, this webinar so you may not be able to uh, ask your questions verbally but i encourage you to put those in the q and a uh, box below your screen and we'll try and address as many questions as we can if not today we'll certainly get back to you with the follow up correspondence to this webinar so without further ado uh, first i'd like to invite uh, mr gautam khanna who is the co-chair of fiki health services committee and also the ceo of uh, hinduja hospital in mumbai and he's also the principal of the singh college at hinduja and and he's a is a great healthcare leader in the country and he's actually been single handedly responsible for the transformation of hinduja hospital uh mr khanna will be sp uh, speaking about the 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 institutional framework for mental health in india and what we are doing uh, to ensure the mental well being of our uh, covid warriors um so mr khanna over to you thank you ajwal and thank you shobha for this opportunity as uh, you already emphasized that it is a very very relevant uh, subject for all of us in the country and especially for healthcare workers so i am happy to share some thoughts about <clears throat> what is the status in the country and what we are as, uh, doing as a hospital so uh, ujwal can we see the next slide so so if you look at this this is the current state of uh, mental health in india and what you will be surprised to see that there is a high incidence of mental health conditions across all genders and across the age group so there is no specific uh, gender or age which gets affected however there is a certain age bracket of 40 to 49 which is which has the highest incidence which could also be because they are probably the ones who reported the maximum and there is also evidence that there is incidence higher in urban than rural again it could be because maybe many rural cases are not reported however the the key issue here is there is a huge treatment gap for example out of 150 million people in india who need interventions only 30 million are actually seeking care so there is a big gap and if you look at the graph at the bottom uh, left the blue bar charts you will see that there is a treatment gap and and if you can see the maximum gap is in the what is called mdd which is the major depressive order 
and in alcohol use disorder. So there are people who need uh, treatment, but 85% of them are not getting treatment. And similarly, if you see on the right hand side, uh, the graph which talks about rural and urban, you see there is a big difference between the type of disease and what is reported in urban and rural. So there is something to be said about this. So based on this, government of India has taken a lot of steps and I'm going to share in the next slide, Ruchal, please. So government has set up state mental health assessment, systems assessment and they have uh, formed a policy in 2014. Then there was a Mental Health Care Act in 2017. There have been a lot of judicial directives. There have been initiatives by the National Human Rights Commission. And a lot of money has been starting, in, even including this budget, has been put into mental health by the government of India. And of course, now uh, this district mental health programs have expanded to almost 200 districts. And uh, a lot of care is being taken to improve the mental hospitals in the country. However, if, as you can see, on the right hand side, you can see the different states and you can see the disparities. And now these are number of uh, psychiatrists, clinical psychologists and so on. So now the important thing is that more and more straight HIMS need to cover mental health. Of course, some exceptions like Chhattisgarh, Gujarat, MP and Punjab exist, but we still need to improve the state wise disparity. The availability of psychiatrists, as you can see on the right hand side, I mean, it is not uniform. So there is an issue. We need to spend a lot of um, money on spending on awareness and encouraging the research on mental health and try and see if we can include mental health as an overall integrated healthcare for the patient. So what we need for this is that we need an overall action plan by the states in, in partnership with the private that what we have to do to address this. And for example, in some states like Kerala, 100% of districts are covered by mental health programs. However, in states like Punjab, it is only 13 odd percent. So what it means is that there is a lot of work need to be done by the states in terms of funding, financing, and so on. So which will just, so now, I mean, that was quick on the country, but look at what COVID has done for the healthcare workers. And earlier Shobha talked about the study in China. So if you see the uh, graphs on the right hand side, you see, the, um, the the number of healthcare people uh, affected with depression, anxiety, insomnia, and so on. But if you see on the left, the left top is a study in April, which is two months ago from West Bengal. And you can see that around 34, 35% people had depression and the color grading, you can see very severe was also there. And then anxiety, stress. So it was common in doctors at that time, COVID had just started. And the one on the bottom left you see is from Singapore. Again, it was April. So we don't have anything for uh, June now. And I, and I think the way it has happened, it will probably be much more. So that explains to us the criticality of addressing the mental health of the healthcare workers. So I'm going to talk about in the, this slide about what has happened in our hospital and what we have seen in the hospitals in the city and in the country. So, you know, what are the main reasons why the fear and stress is there? So firstly, we must understand that the healthcare worker is coming to the hospital to take care of patients and leaving the family behind. So they are concerned about their safety. They are concerned about the family's safety. And also they have a perception of what are the safety measures being taken at the hospital for them and for the patient. So sometimes if there is a disconnect, you will have some concern. Then there is a negative and fear of the colleagues. So people are scared. People are not working in COVID. They have a different attitude. Then we have seen there is a lot of hostility from the society, the press about negative attitude about the hospitals. And if some one case goes wrong, then there's a lot of negative press. All this builds on to the healthcare worker. And then, you know, there is long working hours and there is no, it doesn't seem to be any end in sight. So, you know, these tough working conditions with tough, uh, uh, you know, they don't get time to eat properly, water intake is not enough. So overall physical stress also adds to the mental stress. However, what helps them, of course, is a supportive and proud family. You know, if they can see any positive role models and, and if they are appreciated by peers, the patients and society, then it tends to validate that why they are doing what they are doing. 
and if there is some corrective guidance if they have rest if they have adequate you know resources to go to so i am going to share what we have done at our hospital so what we have done is that we have organized uh, uh, every day of the week our in house psychiatrists have given slots to talk to our healthcare workers so every day they can talk whoever in confidence so they don't need to go through the hospital authority they just call them up and many people have been doing that we have been focusing on taking the basic need taking care of the basic needs so that they are not anxious about their physical well being for example transportation accommodation if they want to stay back and not and 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 not go back to uh, go at home because they are concerned about their families they can stay we took care of the quarantine facilities but doing lot of uh, contact tracing if somebody gets affected we provide nutritious meals and you know we also take care of their affected and they don't have a place to stay we take care of uh, their hospitalization although that may not be recommended in our hospital but we have taken a place then of course strong and clear uh, protocols about safety and pp as per the guidelines of who and cdc and so on and on and then there are different task forces which are uh, uh, operated for critical and operational decisions which are very fast and so that also enables direct communication across all levels so these task forces have people from different levels so it doesn't need to wait through hierarchy if there is an issue which was raised in the morning it will get addressed in the afternoon that also reduces the stress and and uh, i mean we are involved all the senior management is involved in these task force on a daily basis then all the decisions which we take whether rules protocols everything it is conveyed in english hindi marathi through notice boards through emails through uh, zoom calls so a lot of these things happen and there are formal and informal uh, communication events where i would be addressing where the different department heads would be addressing and you and and of course informally also then we are planning certain de stressing activities for the staff and in addition to that we also requested the non covid staff to volunteer to help the covid staff even if it is for paperwork even if it is to do something else so that the covid team doesn't feel alone they know that all everybody in the hospital is with them and then of course we do uh, every week we are running a meditation on twin heart and of course we have done workshop on art of living for people who are interested so there a little bit of spiritual uh, angle also we are giving so that people can be aware and feel connected to the higher power and so they are able to manage this anxiety but i think the overall message i would like to give at this point in time is that the main thing which we like to do in the hospital which i think has worked till now is for all of us to display empathy care for all levels of hospital workers it is not that just because person is junior or is a senior consultant they won't go through it it is we we've seen evidence across the levels so this is what we have done and hopefully uh, we are doing the right thing and i'll be happy to uh, listen to any comments or suggestions thank you so much thank you uh, mr khanna that was a, a very pertinent message uh, specifically a stark reminder of how important it is to address mental health in india uh, with those numbers that that you share kindly shared with us and also the the wonderful things that that are going on at hinduja hospital and i think uh you know the the uh, private and public sector is much to learn from these uh, initiatives uh, next i'd like to invite dr atreya ganguly who's the national professional officer for mental health and substance abuse at uh, the world health organization country office for india uh, dr ganguly is a uh, is a medicine and public health specialist as has worked across the spectrum of public health interventions from uh, maternal child health non communicable diseases and you name it and specifically now uh, you know she is here to share with us the global international framework from who's perspective on what implemental uh, implementable strategies india can adopt and specifically how we we can look at certain mental health uh, promoting activities uh, dr gangli over to you thank you so much uh, uh, at the outset i uh, i thank uh, fiki for giving who an opportunity to be a part of this great event definitely i agree with dr mr gautam like mental health is an issue and we all are affected in some way or the other 
So the outline of my presentation today would be uh, COVID-19, mental health and psychosocial support. What guidance exists globally for mental health and psychosocial support for COVID-19? How we can look after ourselves and mind our minds and also some uh, psychosocial support resources which are available. Next please. So uh, this is the uh, inter intervention pyramid. This is adapted by uh, from the uh, interagency's standing committee for humanitarian support. This is uh, basically the, you know, we can say the Gita, the Bible of uh, humanitarian support. And it talks about a pyramid wherein you, in the base, you have the community, uh, which is uh, further strengthened by, uh, you know, uh, the further strengthened by interventions, uh, which are relatively focused. And then on top of that, you have the uh, personalized care. Uh, and also on the very much in the top, they have, you can refer to them to uh, various uh, institutions. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, keeping this in mind and this as the backdrop, uh, how do we protect ourselves? Well, uh, in the sense like if we protect ourselves, if we take the uh, precautions, if we follow all the precautions, we are definitely at ease mentally so that uh, we will not be infected. The primary thing these days are wearing of mask, which is mandatory, washing hands. If you are using, uh, I mean, touching uh, patients or, you know, uh, some uh, soil clothes or things like that, please do use gloves. Uh, if, if there is uh, no uh, washing, hand washing facility available, please use the sanitizer. Social distancing, or I would say physical distancing, wherein people are physically apart, but, you know, emotionally connected, please do maintain this distance and also avoid uh, crowded places. Uh, cuff hygiene or sneezing hygiene is very important wherein you cover your mouth or the, you know, you cuff in the uh, flex uh, elbow so that uh, the, uh, the, you know, saliva shard doesn't go. And that is also important because this, it goes about uh, one and a half to two meters. So if you maintain distance, then even if a person cuffs, then you are not uh, affected by the um, cuff um, spurts. Please. Next, please. Yes, uh, physical health has got a great bearing on mental health. Yes, eat uh, healthy, eat nutritious diet, eat on time, balanced diet, be away from junk food, exercise regularly. Uh, when during lockdown restrictions, you know, try to have exercise uh, at home. Yoga is very important. Breathing exercises, they help to calm yourself. Sleep adequately. Sleep is very important. What happens is during lockdown, people tend to, you know, stay awake late night and then get up late in the morning. Then they skip their breakfast because they have to start working. So please maintain a regular routine that helps to keep you calm and cool. Be connected with others. That's very important because uh, if you connect with others, if you share your thoughts, your concerns with others, the other person who is also going through the similar, uh, you know, similar mental uh, conditions will also say, oh, I'm feeling the same. So you will not feel uh, like you are the only one who is suffering. Also minimize the news intake because what happens is these days because we are at home, we are in front of our screen because of, you know, working from home uh, or alternate arrangements, we tend to uh, browse through different uh, uh, websites which give various types of news and many of them scary and depressing. Please be away from them. Just look into um, websites like uh, MOHFW, ICMR, uh, WHO, which are, you know, authentic uh, websites and give information which are authentic and useful. Also, during this time, people may feel bored and they uh, tend to, you know, uh, indulge in tobacco, alcohol, drugs and also internet addictions. Please be away from them. They are hazardous. Next, please. Next slide, please. Yes. Minding our minds. This is very important. If we are in isolation or if we are, you know, confined to, uh, at home or we are in quarantine, we really need to remain connected. Phone, internet, uh, Skype, uh, Zoom, whatever. We need to be interconnected with each other. Listen to music. 
not only music if you have any other hobby like dancing painting uh, create anything creative please do uh, get involved in that that will help you to soothe your mind and keep you away from negative thoughts remain busy if you are working fine if you are not working then do some household work do something creative as i said that will help you in keeping your mind cool be with your family this i would say because now uh, these days when we have to support our families we have to do all the household work as well as our office work it is good that you know everybody in the family contribute and then there is no stress of the work at home help others this is very important we may see you know elderly couples in our in your uh, neighborhood who really need help we can you know be a support do their shopping uh, reach out to them if they need any help talk to them on phone so that they feel connected and lastly very important be cognizant that you are having some stress symptoms if you feel that way please do refer to a special uh, uh, i mean seek professional help be it a counselor be it a psychiatrist or a psychologist this is very helpful next please well now uh, there are there are a lot of uh, global gu guidance as i said followed by a lot of who documents wherein you know you can uh, access them and get uh, some inputs they may be on uh, you know the covid uh, the uh, iasc interim guidance something on the basic psychosocial skills which a health worker may be knowing something on stigma a social stigma which is very very much uh, associated with covid 19 and also uh, there are operational guidelines how to have multi sectoral coordination during the psychosocial support because as you have seen it is not just the health but also beyond health that is in Ball. like you have the alcohol smoking the internet all these things are beyond the realms of the health ministry to continue there are a lot of resources like on parenting on screen use that's very important who is very much advocating for you know limited screen use to, uh, how to manage stress we have how to be away from tobacco alcohol and substance abuse during these days next please yeah these are some snapshots wherein you know there are uh, posters on how to uh, you know remain uh, cope with the stress uh, similarly cope with stress in children there are some many on uh, substance abuse on internet uh, uh, internet gaming and you know internet addictions so these can be accessed from who website next please uh from india we have in india also have lot of resources if you go to the mhfw website there's plethora of resources which one should definitely access and feel uh, you know elated about it we have the the, the national helpline is there the national helpline is uh, based at uh, nimhans also the states have their independent helplines also uh, there is a campaign by ministry of health and family welfare on stigma and discrimination and our honorable prime minister has you know really gone ahead and uh, protect the health workers an ordinance have come out wherein the people who are stigmatizing and harming the health workers will be strongly penalized district mental health program it is presently in about uh, 690 districts of india and they are uh, playing a great role in providing psychosocial support to the people especially the migrant population who were badly affected during these plays uh, also risk communication and community engagement this is a drive by government of india wherein you know beyond the realms of this uh, health programs the community should be strengthened to take care of themselves the body uh, body system or the peer uh, system should be cultivated so that you know people can support each other also the civil society and public health sector uh, public and private health sectors have got various initiatives which are providing a lot of support and to end with uh, this is a film please uh, play it the messages uh, in one shot
so with this message i thank everybody for your patient listening and as our whole, uh, our ancient scriptures say sarve santu sukhinah sarve santu niramaya let all be safe happy and healthy thank you thank you dr ganguly for the very pertinent message and uh, all the plethora of resources available from who and uh, particularly directed at substance abuse and you know the societal and family support and and the key promotional um interventions that you actually spoke of i'm um, now to actually come to the the point where we start talking about we've addressed uh prevention and promotion at a primary and secondary level uh but what do we do when we have to actually treat uh, these cases of uh, you know in with mental health issues and for that i'd request uh, professor matthew wargis uh who's a professor of psychiatry at nimhans and one of the leading researchers in in uh, mental health conditions specifically dementia schizophrenia and he's been part of the uh, the author panel for and has done the world mental health survey in india contributed to the global burden of disease study uh, the gbd study on on mental health as well uh, so professor wargis i'd request you to give us a sense of uh, how do we actually deal with these conditions when you know when we avoid cases coming to you but eventually when they do uh, what is it that uh, we need to know professor wargis over to you Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ujjwal. Um, can you see me? Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can yes. see. Yes, we can hear you, uh, Professor Vargis. Please yeah. go ahead. Yeah. So um, I'm. Uh, thank you very much to Fiki and also to Elsevier for uh, asking me to speak. um i'm happy to speak at this very pertinent webinar where we are talking about how to help help healthcare workers deal with this pandemic um as ujwal pointed out and we discussed in the beginning uh the primary and secondary preventions have already been covered and as all of you would know all of you being doctors in the panel in the uh, as participants would know um really the interventions that help the most are the large systemic interventions like the primary interventions so changes at the very large systemic level in terms of organization setting this right is very important and preventing problems is important so secondary prevention is very important as athre pointed out self care measures are extremely important i always say that you should do the first two and avoid coming to the psychiatrist because by the time you come to the psychiatrist uh you are talking about tertiary preventions and these are the least effective actually so you are trying to see that uh you prevent a problem and you do not actually come with a psychiatric problem now we are basically talking about in the covid situation normal people normal people who are healthcare workers and because of their job because of the stress that they face at their job they are exposed to these extraordinary situations and now case covid and so we are really not talking about a core psychiatric disorder we are talking more like uh, what happens in a burnout situation so it's very common uh, uh, you know that healthcare workers are stigmatized for various reasons and this is now the reason if they say that they have a mental disorder they get stigmatized even more so it's really not these are symptoms that people have because they're facing an extremely uh, traumatic situation so people can very commonly present with difficulties in concentration difficulties in the eating pattern uh, your food habits go haywire when you're on duty your sleep patterns go haywire you know you don't have the normal sleep wake cycle and so both your pattern and the duration of sleep goes sorry uh, you might get irritable and angry you might tend to misuse or use substance which as athre pointed out is not a good idea uh, it might be a common thing that you know you come back and from duty and then just to relax you have you know alcohol or you have some other drugs to make you sleep or you know you you smoke now uh, anxiety is pretty common in these conditions and so 
You can have very simple anxiety, which is common because you are afraid of COVID. You're afraid of the uncertainty and afraid of catching COVID and dying or your family members or relatives having COVID and dying. So one is a very simple, basic anxiety because of the illness and that's really an adjustment issue. But you can have a more serious psychiatric disorder and that is having anxiety disorders or panic or even post-traumatic stress disorder. And post-traumatic stress disorder might be the most uh, severe of the conditions because um, in, in this condition, you can actually have you know, visions of patients who you saw or you know, um, serious occasions that you witnessed in the, in the emergency and so on. And you can, of course, you can also have uh, depression. You can have mild depressive symptoms, but I will tell you later on about how depression is clinically diagnosed uh, by a psychiatrist and you know it's also very common you hear all over the country a uh, few few healthcare workers you know attempting suicide or uh, committing suicide next please next please the common manifestations for all of you when you see people at work and this is something that as a bystander as a colleague this is something that you must watch out and pick up in your colleagues and in your in your, in your friends and the other people who you work with. Uh, one of the common things that happen is absenteeism. So uh, the healthcare worker you know, stops coming or uh, is very irregular in his job. His, his or her job performance goes out, goes down. They're not able to work and do things as much as they were doing earlier on. As I mentioned, there are uh, rapid changes in mood. People get short tempered, people shout and scream at people. They might just break down into tears and cry without any reason any apparent reason. Uh, they might uh, report intoxicated to work, which can be a problem. They might uh, be smelling of alcohol or they might actually take some other drugs, especially if they're taking some benzodiazepines or other sleeping tablet in the night. They might complain of poor memory and concentration and uh, they might say that they have an impaired uh, physical capacity. They might feel tired, they might feel weak and they might have a difficulty with doing daily functions. Next. Next, please. Now, this is a, um, this is a scale uh, to actually pick up uh, very early signs of anxiety or depression, which, is, which requires psychiatric treatment and requires little more in-depth uh, counseling, therapy, or psychiatric treatment with medicines. And uh, these, are, these are quick six questions that you can ask or you, know, you can notice of people around you. Uh, and, and this is something that you can ask people. Do you feel nervous? Do you feel hopeless? Uh, do you feel restless or fidgety? Uh, have you felt so sad that nothing could cheer you up? And uh, how, have, you, do you, have you felt that everything was an effort? And um, have you felt worthless? Now, to be a psychiatrically significant symptom to diagnose depression or anxiety, these symptoms should have been present for more than two weeks and definitely for a month. So anything more than two weeks might make you think that the person is having significant clinical depression or anxiety disorder. So you can see that the first uh, two or three questions are for anxiety and the remaining questions are for uh, depression. So if you quickly screen, you can actually make out whether somebody is having a problem. And this is, you must actually, uh, you can easily ask these questions of your colleagues Seniors can ask their juniors or you know you can ask friends who have this problem and see whether uh, they are actually suffering from uh, an issue of anxiety or depression. Now there are other quick scales. I'm not, I mentioned this one because it's the simplest because there's six questions. Uh, but there are other scales where uh, you can actually look at, um, you know, the, you, can, you have the PHQ-9, you have the GAD-7, um, I think you've skipped some questions. Skip the slide, I think. Are you missing a slide here? So this was the uh, the Kessler's uh, scale, uh, the Pugarghi's, which we which we had on from from what you had shared. You're missing a slide here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Why don't you uh, give give our viewers a sense of uh, the PHQ scale and uh, you know the insomnia insomnia? Yeah. So, 
so the uh, no no uh, so the these symptoms if the person has got depression or um, or or uh, anxiety they might need more detailed counseling interventions or they might need medication might have to give some benzodiazepines or he might have to give um, ssri because if the if the if the depression or anxiety is significant and it's really affecting them and they cannot function in their daily activities you'll have to give them some treatment you can have counselors uh, being readily available to help with uh, the, um, the patients so many times you have a room wherein you can go and every hospital can provide this where you can actually go and sit down and talk to a counselor and tell them what's bothering them because it's important that you uh, share uh, things with people and actually you know um, see that somebody is there to help you out so uh, that's the um, that's that's what i have as far as i had a slide here which is somehow gone missing um we'll uh, I, i think dr vargis uh, the uh, the message was uh, you know uh, quite well received and uh, going by the sense of uh, uh, the actual uh, you know afflictions as such when it comes to uh, you know a psychiatric uh, disorder per se uh, we've got a sense of 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 the actual prevention screening detection specifically from from colleagues and also a sense of how those are treated from your perspective so why don't we actually get into uh, you know the questions that yeah, i i think i think we can get into the discussion because i had one extra sure. slide which is somehow gone missing from this deck and that was basically on management of stress anxiety and depression and i think arthur has covered all these some of the aspects of self care and right. but i also had something on problem solving enhancing your social supports and then of course doing various things to manage anxiety and depression but sure. i think you can go on with the discussion and i can cover some that's great questions. thank okay. thank you uh, dr vargis um uh, so this i've got i've got a plenty of questions in the the q and a tab uh, but let me start off uh, with uh, uh, dr ganguly yourself and one of the questions is around substance abuse uh, alcohol and you and you mentioned about uh, you know gaming as such you know specifically from uh, from the tender age as such and i and i know that uh you know screen time is is a is a growing problem now specifically you know with our children being at home and one can't actually make out whether you know i i for for sure don't know whether my daughter is attending classes or you know playing games on our laptop so how do we address this you know this is something pertinent to both healthcare workers as well as you know parents as such Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I I think this is a very important question, and uh, with this lockdown situation, it has really amplified now. Uh, we really don't know what our children are doing because they have online classes. Uh, but then WHO has taken this uh, as one of the you know it has included uh, gaming disorder as uh, one of the uh, mental health conditions under ICD-11, the International Classification of Disease-11. well uh, we as parents need to be very uh, vigilant of what our children are doing yet we we need we have to be their friend not policing them and also in a very subtle way try to make them understand that too much of screen time is hazardous there are who uh, guidelines on what should be the minimum screen time it is zero for children below 1 year of age between 1 uh, to 4 years also it is very limited and for everybody i think uh, one should be because it is an addiction uh it takes us away from productive time it kills it eats into our productive time also alcohol and um, uh, substance abuse as uh, dr vargis highlighted that you know people take this in order to have relief or fall asleep but alcohol is addictive and it um, you know decreases our capacity so um, social messaging and you know family support uh, peer um, counseling these are i think at a very population level these are the things which uh, help uh, each other to prevent uh, addictions thank you dr ganguly um the question for you professor vargis uh, uh, mr ajay mishra wants to know what the main cause of mental disease among healthcare professionals in india is is it a lack of precautionary medical facilities or is it because of the patient load uh, or our already you know stretching us already stretched system you know so this is this brings to uh, home the the point about moral injury 
where one is actually perplexed in terms of what to do when you have only so many resources. And I think many healthcare workers now have to, you know, increasingly face this situation where they have to, you know, tell relatives what they could do or they, what they couldn't. Uh, so are those at the root of uh, some of the stressors that we have amongst our COVID warriors, Professor Varnish? Yeah, so if, uh, as all of us know, during the total lockdown period, there were hardly any patients in the hospitals and we didn't really see any COVID patients. And at that point of time, uh, was the time that when the health system and the healthcare workers and everybody was getting prepared to handle the huge numbers that came later on. As you saw in the last month or so, since we've gone out of this lockdown, um, and, and, and with the unlocking, you've seen that the numbers have soared to almost the sort of third largest in the whole world. And obviously, this is something that the health system is, any, any health system, even the US health system, would find it difficult to cope with it. So these are huge numbers. And I think uh, the fact that we were warned and that we were ready helps a lot. But uh, uh, being stressed and being um, uh, uh, sort of stressed out and pushed out and in a time of this kind of pandemic is something that is unavoidable. So uh, as we mentioned, there has to be something that is done from the organizational perspective, in the sense that the hospitals that you work in or the large setups that you're in, or even a small PhD that you're in, there should be a mechanism where the administration or the organization sort of helps and understands that there are these kind of issues and makes arrangements for you know, taking care of the mental health of people. Then of course, there are things that you must do. So many, many healthcare workers, you know, doctors, nurses, they just plunge into it and start working. Um, and they work, you know, eight hour shifts or 12 hour shifts, and then sometimes even longer. And you forget to take a break, you forget to uh, relax, you forget to go back and do your housework, uh, maintain a schedule back at home, because all the time you're thinking only of what the death and, you know, disease that you're facing. Yeah. So uh, we, we take note of things only when we are actually hit by depression or anxiety and we can't function any longer. So being aware and doing something to avoid things is very important. And I think that's the reason why, you know, uh, people get affected. So as I mentioned, uh, the primary and secondary interventions are the most important. And we hope that people don't get to the tertiary stage where people get actually depressed or anxious or, you know, sleepless or taking yeah. uh, Makes, makes total sense, uh, Professor. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Mr. Khanna, this one's for you. There's, there's some compliments on how beautifully you've drawn the overall comprehensive picture of mental health in India. Uh, Pawan sends his compliments. The other part, uh, Mr. Ramnath Thakur, uh, his understanding is that good spiritual health is, is uh, really critical in this and taking a cue from the interventions you've, uh, you know, kind of conducted at, at Hinduja. Uh, the question is what percentage uh, of weightage would you give to spiritual health? I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure he's not looking for a, you know, decimal accurate, uh, uh, you know, answer, but uh, the, the sense is how important is spiritual health in, in this whole uh, scenario? So, I mean, I, obviously I cannot answer that because it obviously depends on each person's belief systems. So only thing I can tell you is that it helps. So for some people, it might be 100%. Some people, it may be close to 5%, 10%. I don't know. But the fact of the matter is that people who have uh, taken help of spiritual support, whatever support they've taken, they have coped it better than the people who have not. So now, whether there is any evidence, whether 100%, 50%, I don't know. But I think it also... Uh, it, you know, there are some people who may not say it openly that they are taking spiritual support. Uh, I mean, even in a hospital, not many would do openly meditation and things like that, but they would do it in private because for some reason in the society today, it is not so cool to talk about spiritualism and you, you I mean, so something yeah. is, is that right? <laughs> Somehow I thought it's the other way around. It seems so no, I, 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 I think, I think people, people like to talk, uh, believe that we are more scientific and rational. <laughs> okay. They would say all this and go and do it at home. So I really don't know what is the number today, okay. but I, I sincerely think that it helps. And uh, what percentage? I don't know, but 
thank you for the compliment for yeah and and i think uh, just going by the fact that uh, the the meditation sessions at hinduja and i have a few friends who i discussed with uh, are being so well received by the uh, you know our frontline health workers that gives a, a, a strong cue as to how important spirituality and yes spiritual health essentially is and i think even the who definition has now kind of encompassed the idea of spiritual health uh, also isn't it um, one question from uh, mr tyagarajan is uh, about a nursing officer um you know working in in certain region i think this is coming from personal experience uh, if they if they are obviously if they've uh, nosocomially contracted covid but they are asymptomatic but have to you know be home quarantined as such so what kind of coping strategies would would you recommend uh, maybe uh, professor Gang, um, dr gangli you may you may like to take this one on coping strategies for nursing uh, health workers in home quarantine yeah uh, okay as i had uh, you know uh, very uh, briefly spoken in my presentation uh, the you know how to because see if why you are into isolation is because you have the disease maybe it is symptomatic or asymptomatic so your prime thing is that you need to be at home this will be helpful for you and your family also because they otherwise they will contract the disease so keeping that in mind that you are doing uh, the right thing that will uh, you know give you the uh, energy to uh, tide over this a uh, 14 day um, uh, quarantine or isolation uh, you uh, these, these days uh, the technology has given us lot of scope to be connected to each other in within the confines of your home you can pursue an hobby uh, something you can sort of you know find out what you not you are capable of this is like discovering yourself or rediscovering yourself many of us with the you know uh, fast life we forgotten what qualities we actually had so these things are good and then uh, if as um, the uh, doctor uh, professor vergis had highlighted what are the you know uh, signs and symptoms and what anxiety etc if you feel that you are having such uh, problems please do not shy because mental illness there is no stigma against it it's like any other disease if you have any symptoms with concerning your mind please do approach professional care so uh, these are the few things i would like to thank you thank you uh, Pro uh, dr ganguly uh, professor vargis uh, we have time for one last question and this is a very specific one uh, from tanya agarwal in terms of uh, you know pharmacological intervention so how do you decide if uh, actual pharmacological interventions are um, you know needed and obviously in its wake there is there is this risk of uh, becoming dependent on on medication you know specifically for uh, major depressive disorder or ptsd as such so how do we ensure and you know deal with uh, with this uh, risk of surgery yeah i saw the question on uh, medication and the medicines are first of all not the first thing that you should give you should actually provide very simple counseling or therapy and see as far as possible whether you can avoid medicines but medicines are helpful when the person is extremely distressed he is anxious he is agitated he cannot sleep at all so when the distress is very high you can give medicines for a short period of time now most antidepressants are not addictive so if you are giving a Uh, something like acyclovir or you know, any of the other antidepressants they are actually not addictive and uh, if if you are really going to start them that means somebody has got depression or severe anxiety or panic and if you want to start them you need to give it for a few months but the drugs that are most of the time chosen for a very very short period of time are the benzodiazepines especially the short acting benzodiazepines like the clonazepam or lorazepam Uh, you try and avoid the long-acting benzodiazepines because they go on; the actions go on for more than eight hours. So these benzodiazepines can be given for a short period, maybe a couple of weeks only, and then you quickly take taper them and stop them. Uh, and these are given basically when somebody is agitated, very restless, they cannot sleep at all, they are on, on an edge. So at that point of time, uh, if you try and do counseling or therapy, you just cannot uh, make somebody calm and quiet. To, to actually a person to do counseling therapy so as an adjuvant to help them to take on you know therapy situations you might need to use benzoyl screens for a short period of time but we just wouldn't have a risk of uh, withdrawal right dr vargis with uh, no, just uh, with a couple of weeks you won't have withdrawal and then okay. when the doctor takes you off the drug even taper it and stop it you're not going to suddenly stop it one point taper it correct so that shouldn't cause a problem mm -hmm. but if somebody is going to be on um, 
SSRIs or tricyclic antidepressants or any of the other antidepressants, then they would need to be given for a sufficiently long period of time, maybe even uh, three to six months. In the case of PTSD, if somebody develops PTSD, it's much more chronic and more difficult to treat because the PTSD can, can occur flashbacks and these images can occur even many, many months later. So uh, if somebody gets a more serious depression, a severe depression or severe anxiety or panic, then they will need more intense you know, psychiatric treatment. Somebody also asked a question whether uh, if you have a psychiatric illness, whether you can go on seeing patients. There's no problem at all because uh, if you have uh, mild or moderate depression or anxiety, it doesn't stop you from doing work. Just like if you have a heart condition, that doesn't stop you from doing your work as a doctor. Uh, if you have very severe depression and you can't function on your own, then obviously you cannot uh, work in the hospital and see patients. But otherwise, if you have got a mild or moderate disorder, uh, there shouldn't be a problem at all. You can continue working just like with any sure. other physical condition. Yeah, and specifically with all the you know the tools that uh, Dr. Ganguly and and Mr. Kanna have also shared with us, it, it should uh, certainly be possible to do so. Um, so I'm afraid we've uh, actually come to the point where we'll have to um, request our managing director, uh, Mr. Shankar, call to close this session off with with his uh, final comments, and uh, we'll be sure to you know get back to you with with the replies for the questions that we haven't addressed today. And uh, you can look for any, uh, you know, further correspondence from our side. Uh, over to you, Shankar, for, for the final comments. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Ujwal. And uh, um, uh, my hello to, uh, to all my distinguished panelists over here. So uh, at the outset, uh, I'm very, uh, we are very glad to be able to partner with FIKI uh, to be able to bring together a distinguished uh, panel of experts and to be really able to help address uh, what has really become a, ma a very significant issue in the wake of this pandemic. Uh, I guess uh, the, the, uh, the panel has really covered a, a large landscape, uh, so I'm not going to belabor and uh, you know, kind of uh, give you a summary of what, what the panel spoke, but I think one key element in all of this, just to uh, both complement and supplement the efforts uh, to address, uh, you know, uh, anxiety management for healthcare workers is also the role and importance of uh, digital resources and, and digital health solutions, uh, and, and towards that, uh, so that these are able to be able to uh, uh, be able to help support the mental management issues at the primary, secondary, and, the, and the ter at the tertiary level as well. Um, one of the key initiatives that Elzevia has taken. Uh, is to be able to curate uh, a, uh, a healthcare hub, uh, which really uh, contains all pertinent information uh, with respect to toolkits, uh, research insights, uh, expert insights, research resources, uh, as well as the COVID-19 guidelines. And a, a significant element of uh, within this healthcare hub is what we call the mental and behavioral health uh, you know, uh, piece in this. And I would uh, encourage uh, all of our uh, um, people who've dialed in to be able to access this healthcare hub. We will be at the end of this, uh, hopefully be able to provide a link. This is a free, uh, you know, kind of a resource that uh, Elsevier has made available. And where I, uh, I am confident that you will be able to get a lot of significant support in terms of taking care of yourself. Uh, there's a lot, uh, there is updated uh, peer-reviewed articles and studies. Uh, there are podcasts and webinars which have been updated all the way up to June. Uh, hopefully you will find these very useful. And as we continue, and as uh, Shobha did mention at the outset, uh, we are going to take uh, the next steps in terms of creating roundtables and uh, building off the roundtables, be able to finally be, hopefully be able to come up with a white paper that we would soon uh, you know, publish as well. So. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your participation, and I look forward to more webinars uh, on pertinent issues with all of you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for joining in, and we look forward to having you back on, on the next in our series of uh, webinars. Uh, take care, have a good evening, and stay safe. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Bye-bye.